Talking about Roy Cohn, as I promised, the irreverent Gordon. Uh, so Roy Cohn, depending on who you ask, you're always going to get a ton of different viewpoints and answers. Political people in some circles will tell you, <coughs> excuse me, that he was a juggernaut for the way he could help them. Others might tell you he was a lowlife uh, whose debauchery and evil underhanded ways were the epitome of evil. It all depends on the circles in which you keep, and it, it, uh, it just depends on what your perspective is. Criminals, for instance, loved Roy Cohn. Uh, maybe it was for his brash stance. It, it may have been for his intensity. It might have been for his penchant to fight like hell to obtain acquitt acquittals. Uh, politicians, good and bad, took something from the life of Roy Cohn. He didn't stand on laurels, and he was an in-your-face, brash, crass, bulldog of a human being. <coughs> In one interview, Cohn once explained his methods. Offense was a weaponized device. It's one thing to get ahead of the storm, but Cohn not only stood outside before the storm even hit, but kept swinging even when it did. Uh, Cohn believed the best defense was a great offense. In civil matters, instead of fit, filling, filing you know, one massive lawsuit, he would file nearly a dozen. Each accusation was filed separately and separate civil suits. It wasn't because he couldn't avail of himself one large trial. Rather, he would force the opposition to hire dozens of attorneys. He couldn't force them to negotiate on his if, if he couldn't force them to negotiate on his terms for his client, he would bleed them of their life savings. If he had civil litigation, especially with someone who had a lot of money, he would find a way to dig up dirt to publicly bash them in a form that we might call blackmail and doxing today. The reality was everyone including Khan excuse me, Cone, <laughs> had skeletons. Uh, and if he could unleash them, it just meant he was doing his job for his clients. Uh, uh, Cone's power was uh, derived from an insatiable lust for victory and venom by all means necessary. Uh, look at Donald Trump, who was once a close friend and, and a student of Cone. Uh, many of the things that Trump has done, good, bad, and indifferent, is a page right out of Cohn's playbook. Roger Stone, uh, that's another one who comes uh, right from the playbook of Cohn. Uh, it's been said throughout the years that Cohn, who was a closeted homosexual who would die of AIDS, would out others uh, inside the government to obtain whatever he needed. Roy Cohn was born in the Bronx in 1927 and by most accounts came from a home in which he was chastised by his mother for being ugly and being all too feminine. While she would at times be cruel, she was also very overbearing with him. Uh, in one instance, his father would demand that Roy went to a summer camp and his mother rented a house near the camp just to oversee him to make sure that he wasn't bullied. So while she was very critical of him, she was also completely protective of, uh, and overbearing. Uh, it's likely why Cohn ends up the way he does years later. Uh, in 1946, oh my God, I'm sorry, guys, my phone is going off. Let me turn this. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Give me one second, guys. Sorry about that damn phone. Uh, in 1946, Cohn would complete college at Columbia. Uh, and would graduate Columbia Law School by the age of 20, while Cohn had all he had to do, excuse me, <sighs> sorry, I'm rattled by my phone, uh, while Cohn had to wait until he was 21 to be admitted to the bar, he used his family's connections to get himself a position in the office of the United States Attorney Irving Saples' office. Uh, one of the first cases that he would handle was that of the Smith Act trials of the Communist Party leaders. The Smith Act trials, which took place between 1948 and 58 was a result of federal prosecution in the post-war era during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. Leaders of the CPUSA, which was the Communist Party of the United States, were accused of violating the Smith Act. The Smith Act is a statute that prohibits the violent overthrow of the American government. Uh, the defendants would argue that they advocated a peaceful transition into socialism, and that the First Amendment afforded them the right to free speech, and that their association was protected uh, by being a member of a political party. Uh, and you can look up all that information for yourself. But in 1948, he became a board member of the American Jewish League Against 
communism. He would become an assistant U.S. attorney as the assistant U.S. attorney, Cohn, would then ensure multiple convictions in a bunch of highly publicized trials, uh, specifically of accused Soviet operatives. The first one began in 1950 with the prosecution of William Remington, who was a former Commerce Department employee who was accused of espionage by former KGB defector Elizabeth Bentley. Uh, Cohn would then go on to prosecute 11 members of the American Communist Party for preaching to overthrow the U.S. government. In 1951, Cohn would then play a big role in the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were accused of espionage. Cohn was able to elicit testimony from Ethel's brother, David Greenglass, under cross-examination, which would be central to the Rosenberg's conviction and then subsequent execution. You heard that right. Execution. Uh, Greenglass handed the documentation from the Manhattan Project over to the Rosenbergs, who in turn sold it to a guy by the name of Klaus Fuchs. Uh, Greenglass, would, uh, who should have been held accountable as well, testified to save his own skin, but later would recant, saying that he was threatened by Cohn to lie or else. It wasn't until 2014, believe it or not, that historians would uncover that Ethel's trial was smeared and into judicial and legal improprieties all directed by Cohn, which in fact meant they should have been not have been executed the consensus today is that they were guilty of some things but also framed at the same time it's worth noting that Cohn suggested execution and made no bones about asking for that turns out Cohn also had backdoor meetings with the judge in the case which is highly <laughs> just not right on every level With Cohn's blistering cross-examinations and his ability to obtain convictions and material, the FBI became enamored with Cohn, specifically J. Edgar Hoover. With support from Hoover, Cohn was hired as chief counsel for Joseph McCarthy. Cohn was chosen over Bobby Kennedy. Uh, Cohn would assist McCarthy for the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Mainly, Cohn was hired for his bulldog approach to cross-examinations. Cohn essentially, because of his abilities and acumen, was given free reign to pursue investigations at any level with no oversight. Uh, As McCarthy's anti-communist hearings began, Cohn would play a major role in that as well. The Lavender Scare would begin, which was a moral panic about homosexuals and the United States government, which led to their mass dismissal from government service. Gay men and women were said to be a national security risk, and the communist and, as well, They were considered communist sympathizers, which led to a public call to remove them from state employment. The belief was that gay men and women were more susceptible to being pressured and coerced, therefore posed a threat to the United States. It would then lead to the persecution of all gay people. Cohn was a huge leader of the movement, which is odd, considering he was in fact gay himself, uh, as was Joe McCarthy, and J. Edgar Hoover. They would use the Lavender Scare to enhance anti-communist fervor in the country by saying that communists overseas had convinced several closeted homosexuals employed by the federal government to pass on important government secrets in exchange for keeping their sexuality a secret. As a result, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed an executive order on April 29, 1953 to ban homosexuals from working in federal government. There were dozens who got outed by Cohn and McCarthy, uh, and as a result, many of them committed suicide. Uh, Cohn behind the scenes uh, action, if if we can put it that way, <laughs> came to a serious halt. Uh, G. David Shine, who was an anti-communist propagandist, joined McCarthy's staff as an unpaid consultant. Shine would be drafted in the U.S. Army in 1953, and Cohn made huge efforts to get Shine special treatment. Cohn would contact the Secretary of the Army, and he demanded that Shine be given light duty, extra leave, and be exempt from going overseas. Cohn threatened that if they did not do what he wanted, that he would wreck the Army. The issue, along with McCarthy's claims that there would be communists in the Defense Department, would lead to the Army-slash-McCarthy hearings of 1954. Uh, The Army would charge that Cohn and McCarthy were using and applying improper pressure on Shine's behalf, and McCarthy and Cohn countercharged that the Army was holding Shine hostage in an attempt to stifle McCarthy's investigations into communism in the Army. The truth is, both McCarthy and Cohn were having a sexual relationship with Shine. The problem was, uh, this whole entire McCarthy versus the Army shit ruined McCarthy's reputation, and Cohn starts to see the writing on the wall, and he 
leaves McCarthy and he enters private practice. As Cohn entered private practice, he would become a juggernaut. Let's just be honest about it. In 1964, the feds would indict Cohn. Cohn was always, Cohn always speculated it was merely harassment from the government over the McCarthy era, but he would be indicted on bribery charges in the United Die Stock Fraud case. The government's claim was that Cohn took $50,000 from a Vegas gambler. They charged that the payment was made to keep the gambler and three of his friends from being named in an indictment in the $5 million United die in chemical corporation stock fraud case according to prosecutors not only did Khan accept the bribe but he also obstructed justice by lying to a grand jury by getting witnesses to change their testimony and this was roy Cohn 101 uh that's just what he did use offense as a defense uh word has it that Cohn got dirt on witnesses and out of fear those witnesses would recant their stories it's not the first nor the last time that Roy Cohn would use or employ this tactic. So Cohn's lawyer in this case was a guy by the name of Frank Rochelle, and he was a 66-year-old lawyer who represented John Montana, who was an alleged member of the mafia who took a pinch in the infamous Appalachian meeting of 1957. So who was the Las Vegas gambler, you might ask? Well, that's simple. None other than Mo Dalitz. Uh, allegedly, when Cohn found out the two people were giving information to the feds, Cohn made a call to Mo Dalitz. The next thing you know, the two informants changed their minds about what actually happened. Cohn would be acquitted of all charges and would walk. Uh, the FBI at, after this would sort of be on to Cohn, and it's long suspected that Cohn is the one who gave the mafia information about J. Edgar Hoover's little secret parties. Uh, Hoover, as a result, uh, the... Uh, Excuse me, let me look at my, look at my notes here for a second. Uh, Hoover, okay, so uh, the FBI, uh, Hoover and the FBI, as a result of what Cohn was giving out about Hoover, uh, they would go and offer gangsters a deal. Uh, if they would give up Roy Cohn and his antics, they would leave Las Vegas alone. And the mob told the government to go get fucked. Uh, you know, I bet looking back now, I, I bet the mob wishes they would have done the opposite because what ended up happening in Vegas, you know. Anyway, in 1969, Cohn is indicted again for bribing a city appraiser with $25,000 to obtain secret appraisal data coming from city files, which would have been a huge asset to Cohn and his associates in a proceeding the group brought when the city... Uh, uh, Fifth Avenue coach lines. It had to do with Fifth Avenue coach lines. Allegedly, Cohn paid a bribe to a middleman named Bernard Petruski on June 16th, 1964, outside of the courtroom, outside of courtroom 110 of the Foley Square Courthouse, where Cohn was standing trial for his first indictment. The indictment also charged Cohn with, excuse me, Cohn with extortion, and Cohn allegedly extorted stock from himself from his friend Larry uh, Wiseman who was president of the Fifth Avenue coach lines. He allegedly threatened Wiseman to either hand over the stock or he was going to say that he was involved with the bribe scheme. Witnesses who were involved with the scheme would testify against Roy Cohn. Cohn had options to testify but chose not to. Instead, he smirked and laughed as a parade of witnesses testified against him. Towards the end of, his, towards the, end of the trial, his lawyer, Joe Brill, collapsed on the courtroom. It was right after his closing arguments, but he wasn't quite done. But because of the issue, the judge, for some fucking reason, allowed Cohn to sum up the closing statement. And it was a genius fucking move because it allowed Cohn to do what he does best, argue, and the government couldn't ask him a single fucking question. And that's what he needed to avoid. The jury had not heard a word from Cohn's mouth other than his laughter at the parade of witnesses. They didn't know what his take on the entire allegations were. What, Cohn's end, what Cohn ends up doing is blistering the government for 45 minutes. Jurors wept at Cohn's words. He made it not a case against the country, but a case against Cohn personally. The jury would find him innocent of all charges and acquit him. It was that speech. The movement to humanize himself against big government that turned the tide. Cohn knew how to beat them at their own fucking game. 
So as that trial ends, Cohn becomes known as the defense attorney of defense attorneys. The fact that he thumbed his nose at the government and beat them at every turn made him beloved in criminal circles and especially in political circles. It would lead him to defending some of the biggest names in organized crime, Carmine Galante, John Gotti, Tony Salerno, Mario Gigante. He would go on to defend Donald Trump, Studio 54 owners, George Steinbrenner, the former owner of the Yankees, Aristotle Onassis, the Rome, Roman Catholic Archdiocese of New York, Stern Moody Jr., and the list just goes on and on and on. In 1971, the government comes at him again, but he did as he always did. He beat the government into the fucking ground. The way that Cone could utterly destroy someone was epic, but at the same time, we have to be honest, uh, he was a dirty fuck too. He made up his own rules as he went along. Cone made a ton of money, but he also knew how to bend the rules. For instance, he owned several lavish homes, but he put them into corporations knowing that if he stopped paying the government, like tax-wise, they couldn't come after him for anything. And he was a lifelong tax evader and owed millions and millions of dollars to the IRS. He never paid a single bill most of his life. And he could give two shits what the government thought about it. In his career, he was accused of multiple things, blackmail, threats, theft, obstruction, extortion, tax evasion, bribery, fraud, perjury, witness tampering, and the list just goes on and on. Anyone who dared to sue any of his clients regretted it immediately as he would send them happy grams in the form of threats. And when that didn't work, he wasn't shy about going over to their house in the middle of the night and taking a shit on their front porch. If that didn't work, he would dig up somebody's past, walk over and knock on their door, and in one case, ask a famous actress if she would like to see the photos of herself with three cocks in her mouth. <laughs> this guy's a fucking animal. He would do the same to men. He would threaten to expose them for their sexual dalliances with underage girls and boys. This guy was popular because he went to insane, excuse me, insane extremes. <clears throat> As I said, Cohn was notorious, not just about not paying his bills, but refusing to pay taxes. Anybody who got in his way, he would bury them in a smear campaign that they couldn't come back from. And this is one of the reasons why Cohn was so important to criminal clients. He would go above and beyond reproach to help them. 20 years in a row, beginning in the 1970s, the IRS would order, audit his taxes. And for a long time, he beat them. But just as Cohn was a great lawyer, the human being was complex and borderline <laughs> for a lack of better terms, evil. Uh, in one particular incident, he went to a visit a dying client. And Cohn forced him to sign his name on a Cosadil, making Cohn a beneficiary of his life insurance. It was things like that that perverted the legal system and made Cohn a complete criminal in every sense of the word. In 1973, Cohn uh, had a 95-foot yacht named Defiance. Imagine that, Defiance, of all fucking names you could pick for a boat, but somehow it explodes in flames. Cohn had used the yacht to entertain and bribe politicians, celebrities, and criminals. The yacht would end up sinking, and the captain and crew survived, but Charles Martinson, who was uh, a crew member, a young crew member, died in the blaze. Word began to trickle out that Cohn ordered people to set the yacht on fire so he could collect $275,000 in insurance. The Martinson family blamed Cohn and blamed Cohn for the death of their child. Cohn collected the insurance, paid off the mortgage of the boat, and went on a spending spree, ignoring the Martinson family. So we mentioned Donald Trump earlier. So what was his role with Donald Trump? Well, in 1971, Trump was making headway into large construction projects here in Manhattan. And in 1973, the Department of Justice accused, excuse me, accused Trump of violating, violating the Fair Housing Act in 39 of his buildings. The government was alleging that Trump's corporation quoted different rental terms and conditions and made false no vacancy claims to African Americans for apartments that it managed in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Uh, Cohn would represent Trump and would file a countersuit for $100 million, claiming that the charges were baseless and irresponsible. While the countersuit would fail, Trump would settle out of court in 1975, claiming that he was satisfied that there was an agreement that didn't compel the Trump organization to accept people on welfare as tenants unless they qualified just like other tenants. The corporation, as a result, was forced to submit biweekly lists 
of vacancies to the New York Urban League, which was a civil rights group, and they had to give the league priority in certain locations. Trump would violate that order in 1975, and once again, Cohn would go to the rescue. Cohn, while a general sleazebag in many, many ways, helped pave the way for Donald Trump uh, buildings. Not only that, but he was instrumental in Trump Towers. Uh, and, and this is interesting. So when Donald Trump was building the Trump Tower, right, he had to use millions and millions and millions of like cubic feet of concrete. But at that time in the city, there was a Teamster strike, which meant you couldn't get fucking concrete. Most of the unions in Manhattan, however, were controlled by the mafia. Cohn, who had represented mobsters in the past, actually approached Paul Castellano and Tony Salerno about the problem. Castellano and Salerno agreed to help Trump for a kickback and allowed the Manhattan Concrete Union to help, despite the strike. It was through union leader John Cody who sort of oversaw that whole ordeal. Cohn was also responsible for putting Rupert, Rupert Murdoch and Ronald Reagan together, and Cohn repeatedly pressured Ronald Reagan to further Murdoch's interests, despite Reagan not wanting to. So, Roy Cohn put Rupert Mur Murdoch on the fucking map. So, in 1979 and 1980, Cohn would help Roger Stone during Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign. He helped Stone arrange for John B. Anderson to get the nomination for the Liberal Party of New York, which directly impacted the uh, opposition to Reagan in the state. Stone had said a long time ago that Cohn handed him a suitcase that Stone alleges he didn't open, but was re directed to hand over at a lawyer's office who was very influential in the Liberal Party circles. Reagan would go on to carry the state with 46% of the vote. Stone would later claim they bought the presidency for Ronald Reagan. After that, Cohn became a bit of a political fixer of sorts. Between the late 70s and early 80s, Roy Cohn would be charged three times with professional misconduct, perjury, and witness tampering. He was accused of financial fraud uh, related to city contracts and private investments. The, uh, those charges, Cohn would all be acquitted of. This is a guy you can't fucking touch. Uh, in 1986, a five-judge panel of the Appellate Division of New York State Supreme Court disbarred Cohn for unethical and unprofessional conduct, including misappropriation of clients' funds, lying on a bar application, pressuring a client to amend his will, uh, which went back to 1975. When Joe Bonanno's book would arrive on shelves, Joe Bonanno stated that it was Roy Cohn who acquired photos of Jared Hoover engaging in cross-dressing and homosexual kink acts, both on film and in photos. Hoover was aware of the photos and films, and Cohn threatened to expose him if he didn't get help for his friends. Uh, terrified, Hoover tried to hold back the FBI as much as possible. So, all of Cohn's life, he evaded, he lied, he stole, he delayed, and he trumped the government at every single turn. He relied on those political connections and blackmail to get the job done. He relied more on belligerence than preparation. He would stop at nothing to ensure victory for his clients. You know, his law career might have been over, but it didn't stop Roy Cohn from being Roy Cohn. In 1984, he's diagnosed with AIDS. Uh, he denied the illness and said it was liver cancer repeatedly. And he would deny that he was gay until the very end. Everybody knew he had AIDS. They knew of his dalliances, but would never spill his secret, partly out of respect, but mainly because they were scared shitless of him. Uh, in the end of 1985, AIDS was quickly taking his life. He would appear in public gaunt and gray, but it didn't stop him from living the high life in every imaginable way. That's when the IRS came knocking again. This time, the IRS would file tax evasion charges and were trying to seize his cottage in Greenwich, Connecticut, filing a $7 million back tax lien. The New York State Bar also at that time was moving quickly to make with more charges against him. The door was closed and it was over. A month later, Cohn died a broken man. But Cohn had the last laugh. The IRS couldn't get him. The FBI failed at every fucking turn to get him. And any political asshole who attempted to fuck him over got fucked. If anything that we can take from Roy Cohn, if there is a lesson somewhere, it's that he was ever more just like his clients, more so like John Gotti than Donald Trump. He thumbed his nose at the establishment and gave the finger to the FBI and there was nothing they could do. While we can look back at, back at his legacy and cringe at some of the more sadistic shit that he did, it turns out he was no different than others because in all reality, 
He was just prolifically highlighted because he was good at what he did. Maybe practicing law wasn't his expertise at all. Maybe that wasn't his strong suit. But it's the way he went about it. The way he assailed anyone who wanted to fight. He never backed down. He never gave in and would do anything to defend a client. And while many of the things Cone did in his life are vile, I think we could all in some way, shape, or form hope that if that day came where we needed a bulldog, we needed a voice, we needed a shield, we needed a friend, we would all want Roy Cone in our corner. So there you go. That's Roy Cone. I think the mere fact that he shit on somebody's doorstep is just the most epic shit ever. Uh, it's like Sinatra. Like Sinatra went, uh, Lee Mortimer. Lee Mortimer worked for a gossip columnist. And Lee Mortimer uh, used to say all sorts of horrible shit about Frank Sinatra. Like just the most horrible shit. And at one point, and I believe this took place at the Flamingo, believe it or not. Uh, Sinatra runs into Lee Mortimer. And they exchange words. Lee Mortimer called him a Dago or whatever. So Sinatra popped him in the face and knocked his two front teeth out, right? So years later, Sinatra still seething is reading in the paper that Lee Mortimer has passed away and Sinatra's giggling and excited and, and happy. And, you know, everybody's looking at him like, what the fuck are you so happy about? The guy died. He goes, oh, well, fuck him. He's dead. That not two days, not two days after they buried Lee Mortimer, Sinatra went to his grave and pissed on it. <laughs> and who do you think he got that from? Roy Cohn, maybe? Who knows? Who knows? But that's Roy Cohn. Uh, and I'm sure there's a million other things we could have said about Roy Cohn, but I tried to give you just the juxtaposition of who he was uh, and sort of how he came about. So there you have it. That's the uh, Roy Cohn story. So we're going to take a break. We come. 